Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ryan Gabsky, and I'm the student president of the William F. Buckley Jr. Program. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to our 13th annual conference. As most of you know, the William F. Buckley Jr. Program is the flagship program of the Buckley Institute, an organization dedicated to promoting intellectual diversity at Yale. There are countless ideas, issues, and thinkers that go unmentioned on Yale's campus because they challenge the campus orthodoxy. I'm happy to say that our efforts over the years have created a space where those perspectives can be heard and where students can engage in open political inquiry. So it is appropriate that this year's conference honors the 75th anniversary of Richard Weaver's Ideas Have Consequences. The book has received praise from a wide range of conservative luminaries, including our eponym, William F. Buckley Jr. and Russell Kirk. In fact, some have claimed that Weaver's work provided the American conservative movement with its intellectual foundations. Weaver's book was published in 1948, but it is just as relevant today. Before kicking off the first panel, I'd like to remind you all of our scheduled events today. The first panel will run from 2.35 p.m. to 3.35 p.m. and delve into the implications of our society's rampant denial of truth and inability to believe in transcendental ideas. After that, the second panel, from 3.55 to 4.55 p.m., will discuss the effects of modern American society's leveling of hierarchy and merit. Then, from 5.15 to 6.15 p.m., our final panel will cover the mainstream media and the ways in which it seeks to indoctrinate instead of inform. I should note that there will be a 20-minute break between each of the panels, but panels will begin promptly at the scheduled times. Once the panels conclude, I look forward to seeing you all at the cocktail reception at 6.30 and then for dinner at 7.30, featuring a keynote address by Brett Stevens. So without further ado, I'd like to thank you all for being with us today and hand things over to the moderator of our first panel, Sahar Tartak. Thank you so much, Ryan. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. It's such a pleasure to have you. Um, my name is Sahar Tartak. I'm the outreach director of the William F. Buckley Jr. program. I welcome you. So today, our panelists are going to be discussing truth, how it's, we seem to have lost it in many places, and, and simultaneously, we seem to have this kind of societal inability to, like Ryan said, believe in tran transcendental ideas. So why, where is this coming from? Where does, where does this start? How does it end? So the format of today's discussion are going to be opening remarks by our lovely speakers and then a question and answer. Um, so I'll start things off by introducing our guests. So R.R. Reno has served as the editor of First Things since 2011. He received his PhD in theology from Yale University and taught theology and ethics at Creighton University in Omaha, Nebraska for 20 years. He has published in many academic journals, and his opinion essays have appeared in Commentary, National Review, The Wall Street Journal, The Washington Post, and The New York Times, among other popular outlets. His most recent books include The End of Interpretation, Return of the Strong Gods, and Resurrecting the Idea of a Christian Society. Roger Kimball is our next guest, the editor and publisher of The New Criterion, and president and publisher of Encounter Books. He writes regular columns for American Greatness, The Epoch Times, The Spectator, U.S. Edition. Mr. Kimball lectures widely and has appeared on national radio and television programs, as well as the BBC. Mr. Kimball is also the author of numerous books, including The Fortunes of Permanence, Culture and Anarchy in the Age of America, 
The Long March, How the Cultural Revolution of the 1960s Changed America, and Tenured Radicals, How Politics Has Corrupted Our Higher Education. Mr. Kimball has served on the Board of Advisors of the Gilder Lieberman Institute of American History, the Board of Visitors and Governors of St. John's College, Annapolis and Santa Fe, and Transaction Publishers. He currently serves on the Board of the Manhattan Institute for Policy Research and is Chairman of the Buckley Institute. He is the recipient of a Bradley Prize from the Lind and Harry Bradley Foundation and the Thomas L. Phillips Career Achievement Award from the Fund for American Studies, both in 2019. Stephanie Slade, our third panelist, is a senior editor at Reason Magazine, where she covers the intersection of religion and politics, and is a fellow in liberal studies at the Action Institute. In 2016, she was selected to the very prestigious Robert Novak Journalism Fellowship. In 2013, she was named a finalist for the Bastion Prize for Journalism. Her writing has also appeared in America Magazine, The New York Times, US News and World Report, and elsewhere. So I think we'll start off with our opening remarks, remarks excuse me, and um, Mr. Reno, you can go ahead. All right, very good. Um, topic or the question is, is everything William of Ockham's fault? And I think the short answer is no. Um, it's, I'm opposed to a sort of perverse kind of negative Hegelianism that treats history as an outworking of mistaken ideas. And, um, and I don't think that Weaver really intends uh, us to think of, it, of his book as a genealogy of uh, modernity in that rigorous sense. Um, rather, I think his claim is that our present mental outlook, or what he calls our metaphysical dream, the wonderful notion that he introduces in the first chapter of Ideas Have Consequences, that our metaphysical dream is functionally nominalist. Um, and you know, crudely put, nominalism holds that there are no universals. Um, there are no general statements about truth. Um, <coughs> but rather that our abstractions or general statements are, are, are verbal conventions, the names that we coin, hence the term nominalism. Now, I think Weaver's correct about what our metaphysical dream is, that it is um, transparently true that most professors at Yale are nominalist, um, and they have been for a good while. When they speak of the social construction of reality, they're advancing an essentially nominalist view. And it's not just the professors. I think our society as a whole is largely functionally nominalist. You know, it's, you know, it's, sure, it's, it's surely the case that some people do wince when people say that sex, which is now we have to refer to it as in, under the term gender, is so-called socially constructed, and that therefore men can give birth, as they say. But even those who object rarely have the resources to articulate a basis for dissenting from that dominant view. And that's because of a great deal of modern culture is invested in the denial of universals, um, for they're seen as dangerous threats to freedom and progress. So I think essentially our nominalism is morally motivated. And I think the late Richard Rorty um, illustrates the political reasons for today's obligatory repudiation of universals, which he says has been replaced by a modern scientific picture of what he calls flux of continuously changing relations. So if we're going to say that flux is the deepest truth what it, of reality, this is, I think, the better term to use is nihilism rather than nominalism. Nominalism is a particular kind of theory of language in its relation to, um, uh, to truth, whereas nihilism, is a, I think, casts a broader net. Um, and nihilism doesn't say that nothing exists. Rather, nihilism holds that nothing is permanent. Nothing anchors reality and nothing provides constant and unchanging truths to which we must conform ourselves if we are to be wise and to be happy. So nihilism denies the existence of these truths. And Rorty welcomed nihilism. Um, and he celebrated it as a condition in which we're unburdened of truth and therefore free to seek whatever we want. I mean, nihilism does not uh, suppose that reality doesn't exist, it rather it presumes that what exists has no essential structure, and therefore there's no source of resistance to our creative wills. That's the appeal 
of nihilism. Everything can be made and remade. And again, I think transgender uh, ideology epitomizes this, this promise, the promise of nihilism. Everything is raw material for our making and remaking. And I think the gravamen of ideas have consequences is that nihilism's promise of empowerment is in fact a false one, it's a false promise. Yes, it's true that nihilism frees us from universal truths, but thus liberated we are without the resources to either think or act with purpose and conviction. And I think he rings the changes on this, uh, this paradox of liberation that does not yield freedom. So freed from the obligation to act for the sake of truth, we have no resources by which to resist advertising, social pressure, ideology, and the other homogenizing and dehumanizing forces of modern culture that he documents um, in the chapters throughout the book. Put simply, without a metaphysical dream of universals, we are naked before the world. And thus unmanned, we, like nature herself, we are available for, to powers, designs, and we become socially constructed. Um, and Weaver writes this, quote, man is constantly being assured today that he has more power than ever before in history, but his daily experience is one of powerlessness. Now, if we substitute freedom for power, then the insight becomes, I think, even more poignant. And I think also relevant to the Buckley legacy. We live in a society that promises liberation and delivers the many iron cages of bondage. So, let me give, as someone who graduated from college more than 40 years ago, you know, it was 40, no, it was more than 40 years ago, I can report that today's Yale students are far more free, uh, are told and assured far more free, frequently that they have more freedom than ever before in history, far more so than my generation. And you students are also told that you're not to be bound by archaic notions such as patriotic duty, and certainly not by something so untenable as divine commandments. You are assured that you're free to have sex with boys or girls, or perhaps both at the same time, and you're free to choose your pronouns, even to the point of punishing those who create a hostile environment for saying otherwise. So all this freedom. Yet the same Yale students I would submit in 2023 are far more anxious and constrained than were my classmates those many decades ago. It's very paradoxical, all this freedom, but all this bondage. To a degree unimaginable to my younger self, those coming of age in the 2020s are career fix fixated, status fixated, and appearance fixated. And these are all kind of conditions of bondage to society's rules. And when, when young people are not conformists in this respect, they are moral conformists and often caught up in various moral panics, whether it's about white privilege or climate catastrophe or so forth. I was at an event at Yale uh, a year ago, and one of the students asked me about you know, climate. Don't, don't I worry about climate? I said, actually, I don't worry about climate at all. And she was just aptly flabbergasted that I wasn't really concerned. I said, look, I grew up like, hiding under my desk during uh, nuclear attack drills in elementary school. And somehow we went through life without thinking about being annihilated all the time. But young people today seem to be much more afflicted by these kinds of anxieties and concerns and moral panics. And obviously, when nearly half of Yale's undergraduates are on medication to address psychological disorders and distresses, one can hardly speak of our time as one of great and expansive freedom. So I think Weaver's right. So, conclusion, are Occam and nominalism the root of all evil? I, I'd say I'm hostile to the Lord of the explanations, the one explanation to rule them all. Moreover, human freedom plays a role. We are not, I would submit, victims of bad ideas. I would say that by and large, we embrace and endorse bad ideas. And I think Weaver would agree on this point. We live in a time when nihilism is championed, and indeed, it is obligatory. These days, affirming universal truths gets you denounced as a totalitarian or a fascist or a hater. 
And as Weaver observes, throughout ideas have consequences, a denial of universals reduces us to the unhappy condition of endless public contestations for power on the one hand and private internal slavery to our desires on the other hand. And he thought this reduction to savagery and instinct foretells the end of Western civilization. Not necessarily the end of Western power or wealth, but the end of Western civilization. And I fear, I must say in conclusion, that he may be right about that. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Kimball, we'll have okay. you go ahead. Uh, well, I, I should begin by also acknowledging that I, too, am a climate denier. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'd like to uh, just up the ante on what Rusty said. I, I, I think that the not only the, the short answer, but probably the long answer uh, is that um, Occam is not responsible for everything that's wrong. Now, I, I'd just like to um, say a few more or less disconnected things about this book. The first is that it's a very odd book. It's, very, it's a very odd book. Uh, he begins by saying, this is yet another book about the dissolution of the West, <laughs> you know, and there have certainly been a lot of those. Uh, Ryan mentioned that it was published in 1948, so that's right after the war, the United States was straddling the globe as its only colossus. We were richer than everybody. We had just defeated uh, all of these forces of acknowledged evil. Um, the uh, technological innovation of the country was everywhere. People were, um, they were going f faster in their cars and their jet planes. Their TVs uh, were uh, entertaining them in a way people had never been entertained before. So everything seemed to be going great. And um, then here you have here you have somebody coming along to say, well, you know, really, it's, it's not so great. And uh, I was curious that Rusty picked a passage that, that I also want to quote uh, uh, on the, the principle of repetitio mater memoriae. The more often you hear it, the more likely you're, you are to remember it. The man is constantly being assured today that he has more power than ever before, but his daily experience is one of powerlessness. Now this was written, remember, back in 1948. I think it's, it was, in a way, I'm not sure it was quite true then. I think it probably is true now. And so what he, what he was worried about is a, a constant theme in a certain uh, species of conservative polemic, which is a worry about Prometheanism, the idea <coughs> that somehow man is not only the master of his fate, but the master of the world. So you can trace this, indeed it does go back to William of Ockham and before him to people like Duns Scotus. Uh, and by the way, not everyone knows, I'm not sure that Weaver ever mentions this, that the idea of a dunce, a dunce cap and so on, comes from Duns Scotus. He, uh, some of his people criticize his followers for being like dunces. Um, but William of Ockham, his nominalism, this idea that there are no universals, as, as uh, Rusty says, that becomes a theme that goes all throughout Western philosophy, speculation, right up to the present day. So you have Descartes, for example, who promised that using his method, his, in a way, nominalist method, man would make himself, and this is a quote, the master and possessor of nature. The master and possessor of nature. And he looked forward to a kind of technology, and he mentioned in particular medical technology that would transform the world uh, in, in ways never before uh, contemplated, and I think, to a very large extent, our world is a Cartesian world, and and Descartes, uh, you know, made good on that promise. But there's always a uh, there's been a kind of opposing leitmotif 
in all of uh, in Western speculation, uh, summed up in phrases like, uh, what would it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? And there's always been, alongside this sort of triumphalism, this Prometheanism, uh, uh, another drumbeat, and Weaver certainly participates in this, uh, calling into question uh, the idea that our power over nature is an unadulterated good thing. Uh, so in a way, he's kind of like the prophet Isaiah, you know, he, he, you know and um, he, you, you, you get your prophet license revoked if you come down from the mountain and tell everybody that everything is working out okay. And he definitely did, did not do that. In a way, he's a little bit like the, um, he's a little bit like the slave s uh, sitting in the, uh, the chariot with a Roman general uh, celebrating a triumph, whispering in his ear that remember that you two are mortal. Uh, so he's the, the, the chief value, I think, virtue of this book is admonitory, he's admonishing us. So, uh, you know, he begins right at the very beginning of the book, he talks about the fatal doctrine of nominalism and, and uh, from William Oakham and, uh, and, but he's not speaking as a philosopher, I think Rusty mentioned this as well, he's speaking as a kind of, as a cultural critic, what we call a cultural critic today, and that's, it's both accurate, but also slightly comical to say that um, all of our problems depend upon the speculations of a sort of anti-Thomistic philosopher in the, uh, in the beginning of the 14th century. And yet, and yet uh, you can draw a straight line from William of Ockham you know, through not only Descartes, but through Nietzsche and his nihilism, and to people like Derrida. And today, you know, there's no outside the language, says Derrida. All the signifiers are, are uh, totally arbitrary. Um, I've often wondered what, what Derrida would say if, um, uh, you know, he had a headache, he went to a pharmacy and asked for aspirin and the pharmacist gave him arsenic and said, instead, and, ex and when he got sick, explained, well, you said that all signifiers are arbitrary. But uh, we, we, that's a, uh, that's... <laughs> A, a speculation that we, we don't know the answer to. But uh, I think a, a good way of understanding the, the, the real force of this sort of nominalism uh, that, that Weaver is, is worried about is, is, for example, in the character of Falstaff in Richard III, you know, he's, just talking, to, he's talking to Hal about uh, honor on the battlefield. Hal leaves and he says, what is honor? What is honor? It's a word. What's, what's a word? Air, a mere nothing. Uh, and so if you can believe that about honor, that it's just a word, and a word is just air, a trim reckoning, he says, then uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, a bit like, it's a bit like that C.S. Lewis, that C.S. Lewis remark in The Abolition of Man. He says, you know, we make, we make men without chests and expect of them virtue and enterprise. We laugh at honor and are shocked to find traitors in our midst. We castrate and bid the Geldings be fruitful. Uh, that is, that abolition of man that, that C.S. Lewis talks about uh, is a result of the kind of nominalism that, that, um, that Richard Weaver is talking about. Now, another element in this book, Wilmore Kendall, uh, late of this university, uh, said that said that uh, Weaver was the captain of the anti-liberal team. Uh, I think it's worth remembering that, that Weaver was, he started off as a socialist. He, was, he, he worked for Norman Thomas's uh, presidential campaign. Uh, but uh, you remember Irving Kristol, the late Irving Kristol once said that uh, a neoconservative was a, a liberal who was mugged by reality. Well, Richard Weaver was a kind of socialist who was repelled by modernity. There's, this book is shot through with uh, a kind of romanticism, a kind of nostalgia, a backward looking uh, uh, perspective. He, he encouraged us to, to live strenuously and romantically. Uh, and along with that, you know, came a lot of um, 
quirky ideas, I think. He, when he went back to his farm, he, he insisted that his mother have the fields plowed by mule rather than a, a tractor because tractors were so, you know, this instrument of modernity. So it's, there's a lot of ironies about Richard Weaver. He, after all, he spent his, almost his entire career at the University of Chicago created by John D. Rockefeller. They had just <laughs> split the atom there. They had the great Chicago uh, exhibition about progress and all of that. Uh, so he's, he's, a, he's a, a, curious, um, a curious character. So it, it, this may be a conservative classic, as people uh, uh, say, but it's one, with, um, it's one in profound tension with at least some strains of conservatism. So, for example, on economics, I think we could best describe his economics as quaint. Uh, you know, he says, yeah, private property is the last metaphysical idea. And yet he doesn't really, you know, he's very suspicious of private property. It's a little, little bit like G.K. Chesterton. He, he had this theory of distributism. It's he wanted very small plots of, of land and so on. A small amount of private property was good, but it's very suspicious of capitalism writ large. Um, obviously, uh, I, I try to avoid the word capitalism, actually. It's, it wasn't coined by Marx, but it, but it was popularized by the Marxists, and it, it means, in their vocabulary, exploitation. So let's call it the free market instead. The free market is the, the most uh, powerful engine for the production of wealth that human ingenuity has ever devised. And, I mean, just if you just look at the, the increase in wealth between... Uh, uh, well, even from 1950, say, around the time this book was uh, written to now, but between, say, 1850 and now, it's staggering. It's staggering. Uh, and um, I, don't know that, uh, I don't know that Weaver, well, I, actually, I take that back. I did, Weaver was very suspicious of that. Um, he, you know, because with, with this incredible production of wealth came greater freedom, but that freedom is, was, had pointed in different directions. It meant more choice, but also more dislocation. And he blamed the dislocation. He didn't like that, and he blamed it on the greater choice. So um, uh, many conservatives, I think, would, would, would uh, at least be ambivalent about uh, Weaver's economics. So he, so, so he, there were some words that he liked, some words that he didn't like. He didn't like the word comfort. He thought comfort was a bad thing. He thought middle class bourgeois virtues were kind of a bad thing. Uh, uh, and the, maybe his master uh, term of opprobrium was materialistic. He hated, the, he, he, he hated that. He, he says, um, the, he, describing our society. So this is loving comfort, risking little, terrified by the thought of change. Its aim is to establish a materialistic civilization which will banish threats to its complacency. And in a similar way, but from the opposite point of view, he had lots of nice things to say about the old South, the, you know, the, uh, the um, uh, antebellum South. Why? Because he said, and this is, I think it's the only italicized sentence in the book. It was the last non-materialist civilization in the Western world. What do we think about that? I think that's uh, worth thinking about. Uh, I'm not sure that it's true. Um, <laughs> so it, it, actually, the work of Richard Weaver is, is a little bit not, not unlike that old South that he memorialized, because his, his, it was splendidly appointed, but most of us, I think, would find it sort of uninhabitable. Uh, kind of nice to think about. So I, I think that this book is a, one of those, and there are a lot of books like this, and they can be very important books. It's a yes, but book. Yes, he's got a lot of interesting things to say, but there's a lot of things we have to, uh, have to um, question. Uh, so I, I, my synecdoche for this is modern dentistry. You know, I think uh, if you say yes to modern dentistry, and if you've ever had a toothache, you would, uh, then I think you have to say yes to a lot uh, of other things. And Weaver was very eloquent uh, writing about the disastrous results of Prometheanism and uh, the, the, the bad things about trying to subject the world to our will. But our world is entirely shaped by science. It just is. And uh, what greater hubris could there be to 
categorically reject it, which he, at least rhetorically, seems to do sometimes. So I think actually there's, you know, as I said, there's a lot to be said for this book, but, but there are a lot of things where we might want to pause and say, well, is that really uh, true? I think that his best, uh, the, the best parts of his work are when he's more as concrete as possible, when he, when he actually talks about specific things. Uh, you know, one which we might want to criticize, or maybe maybe not. I don't know. See, he has an extraordinary attack on jazz, uh, which sort of looks forward to Alan Bloom's attack on rock music in the closing of the American Mind, or maybe looks back to Plato's attack on music in the Republic, where he says, "No, we can't. We don't want that, those modes. The the." Uh, the, the Lydian and, and, and Ionian modes, uh, they, they are for people who are, you know, they're for um, dissoluteness and inactivity and uh, uh, we don't want that. We want the Phrygian and Dorian modes. Um, well, so that's been a long standing uh, thread of conservative thought to take music more seriously perhaps than many of us do. But uh, I'll, I'll just end by, uh, by saying one thing that I really admire about Richard Weaver is his discussion uh, in his book, the, the Ethics of Rhetoric, as well as more so than, than in this book, but here too. Um, the way that certain words acquire a sort of nimbus of a positive charge or negative charge. So think about, think about uh, the way that the word democracy or what Nancy Pelosi has taught us to call our democracy uh, has acquired this kind of nimbus of you know pleasant uh, associations he talks about progress is it, can, who, who can speak against progress everybody's got to be for progress or and the progressive mentality and so on so that, that that's a, I think that's a very profound um, profound uh, in, insight on his part it works the other way too why do we associate the word prejudice with bigotry? Prejudice can mean a lot of other things. Edmund Burke uh, said a, a just prejudice, means just prejudging things, renders a man's virtue his habit. So in that sense, prejudice can be a good thing. It doesn't have to be uh, bigotry. So um, having spoken up, having spoken against jazz and spoken up for prejudice, I think I'll stop. <laughs> Thanks so much. Ms. Slade, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, so to the extent that I am a scholar, um, I study modern American conservatism and not medieval philosophy. So I don't feel that I am very well qualified to answer the question of whether or how much we should blame on William of Ockham. But I'm very <laughs> interested in the question of how well Richard Weaver did at prosecuting the case that he wants to make, which includes, of course, claims about William of Ockham. Um, I think the answer is actually not that well. Um, I'm convinced that p at least part of the reason, maybe much of, of the reason, for the enduring popularity and influence of this book in particular has nothing to do with the soundness of the argumentation and certainly not the, the strength of the predictions that he makes in the book, but rather because the three words on its cover um, are very appealing to a certain kind of person, particularly the kind of person that's in this room right now. Uh, the highly educated, sort of intellectually inclined people, um, we believe that ideas matter. The idea that ideas matter resonates with us, right? We are knowledge workers, we trade in ideas. And so this, I think, the idea of a book that waves the flag for ideas mattering, this, this is something that was gonna resonate with a lot of people. And unfortunately, I think many people never went beyond the title page. <laughs> And if you do, you find that this actually really isn't even a book about the fact that ideas matter. I mean, it does make this argument about William of Ockham and nominalism leading to bad things, um, but that's about it. I mean, it's, not, it's certainly not a book that makes the larger case about ideas mattering. I would love to read that book. Uh, somebody ought to write that one. Um, but I think that, that that's really what appealed to a lot of people initially. And then the second thing, the second sort of thing I will say this book has going for it, um, is for those who, did, who do really engage with the substance of what Weaver is arguing, um, it is very difficult, I think, to disagree with him about the sense that something, there's something um, 
troublingly decadent and fragile seeming about our culture, right? He has diagnosed a problem with our culture and it's hard not to agree that something has gone wrong or something is broken or something seems to be, seems to have gone astray um, even back then and certainly today as well. And so in that sense, I would completely agree that there is something very prophetic about what Richard Weaver is doing with this book. Um, all of that said, I find man many of the arguments he makes to be weak, and um, I, I wish that I wish that it, there were more than there, there was more effort made to actually draw the arguments, or draw out the arguments between why does nominalism lead to the things that he thinks it leads to. If we recognize that there are things that have gone wrong with our culture today, and he thinks this idea was to blame, you know, let's talk more about how that happened or what that means. Um, I don't think he did a very good good job of that, and I think one of the things, for example, that we just just to name you know one example. When people talk about what is broken in our culture, both in this book and today when we talk about it, very often a word that we like to use, that we like to reach for, is relativism. Um, and he says that nominalism leads to relativism and that this is a problem. At one point in the book, early on, I think in the introduction, he says, hysterical optimism will prevail until the world again admits the existence of tragedy. And it cannot admit the existence of tragedy until it distinguishes between good and evil. Yet. When I look at what I think is wrong in our culture today, I don't actually think that hysterical optimism is the main problem that I, that I see. When I look at political correctness run amok on our campuses, or the sort of woke identity politics and corporate governance, and many of the other problems in, in our culture, um, I mean, it's not, I do not see an overabundance of laissez-faire, live and let live, you do you and I'll do me being the problem here. Uh, I don't think, um, a mentality where there are no stand objective standards of morality is actually what's going on. In fact, you look at what pro progressive activists are, are up to when they um, sick a mob on a Christian baker who doesn't want to make a cake for a gay wedding, say. Um, this is a, they're motivated by a very militant belief about right and wrong, not an absence of a belief about right and wrong. Um, they it's incredibly moralistic. Now, I, I might, you might think and I might agree that what they think is true is incorrect, that their ideas about truth are wrong, but that's different from denying the existence of truth. So, to me, it, it may be the case that relativism is the legacy of William of Ockham and that, that there may be, you know, things about that that are a problem, but I don't think that that really, the idea of relativism captures many of the core problems with our, our culture and our society today. And the other thing I wanted to raise about this book is that, um, it's, it's his political predictions and policy prescriptions, um, which in Ideas Have Consequences are shockingly sympathetic to authoritarian governance. Um, throughout the book, he speaks admiringly of the Soviet Union, which of course at, at the time in 1948, there was no sense that the Soviet Union was going to collapse under its own weight in the near future. Um, he, he speaks admiringly of Soviet censorship. Here's a quote. They have therefore established state control of journalism. If newspapers can do nothing but lie, they will at least lie in the interest of the state. And certainly it remains to be seen whether the Western democracies with their strong divisive forces can continue to allow a real freedom of the press. He doubts whether the sort of Western liberal free society can survive when competing against an unfree society like the Soviet Union. He also seems to think that a sort of top-down command and control economy might be necessary. Um, because, he says, in a free society, especially a decadent society like ours, people are going to be naturally increasingly lazy. They're gonna, if left to our own devices, we are going to choose to work less, we're gonna choose ever more leisure and ever less work. And so our, our economy is likely to become less and less productive over time unless someone forces us to work, unless their government steps in and tells us that you know, speaking on behalf of the common good, you must, you must be productive. And so again, here's another quote. There seems to remain only the question of whether the West will allow comfort to soften it to a point at which defeat is assured, or whether it will accept the rule of hardness and discover means of discipline. And later, the Russians, with habitual clarity of purpose, have made their choice. There is to be discipline, and it is to be enforced by the elite controlling the state. He seems to think that they are onto something that we don't, that we are not, right? This is, um, and, and I think he, he's afraid on, on behalf of the free society that we are not gonna make it when faced with this competition from an unfree society. However, from our sort of privileged vantage point 75 years later, we can look back and we can ask the question of how these fears and these predictions panned out. And what we know 
is that relatively liberal Western capitalistic societies survived and the Soviet Union did not. As much as there is in this book, I guess this is what I kind of want to end with, as much as there is in this book that's worth chewing on, and I think there are many kernels of truth and wisdom here, um, and again, I, I, I do think it is fair to, to characterize it as in many ways prophetic. Um, anyone who thinks that this is one of the great works of sort of conservative thought in the 20th century, um, you know, worthy of having a conference on its 75th anniversary, I think has a responsibility to grapple with um, the many big things that he got wrong as well as the things that he got right. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. Were you going to say something? Okay. Um, so I'll go ahead for a couple of questions on my end, and then we'll move it into a Q&A from the audience. So actually, Ms. Slade, I, I, I thought that you hit a really relevant point, which is that I see my peers uh, protesting for things that are deeply false on campus and really doing it with a sense of morality. So, so if the problem is not relativism, if that's not what's at the core of this, then I, I wonder what your prescription is. And then I'd also like to hear how um, Mr. Kimball and Mr. Reno, I guess, diagnose this issue. Well, if you don't educate people to think about universal truths, they'll come up with all kinds of sort of debased and ersatz causes that, that fill the void. Um, you know, I think for, for Weaver, the great enemy was complacent, uh, conformist bourgeois liberalism, sort of middle-class liberal America with its che cheerful optimism about the future and its, um, you know, its, and its unreflective affirmations of things like democracy, which, of, which, which uh, you know, anybody that studies the founders or, or our own uh, constitution knows that we don't live in a democracy in a, in a strict sense and deliberately not. It's a mixed blessing democracy. Um, but anyway, that, that complacent was opposed to. So I think that there's a, there can be an hysterical optimism, but there can also be an hysterical pessimism. And both are, are a problem because they're unmoored from any kind of reflective attention to reality. And so if people, if people cannot distinguish between directly and intentionally killing innocent civilians and regrettably um, foreseeing but not intending uh, uh, the death of civilians in a military uh, uh, operation against an adversary. If you cannot make that distinction, moral distinction, you are completely at sea. And so, so I think Weaver's right in that regard that the, the, the symptoms, the, the, the illness manifests itself in different ways in different times, but the underlying illness is a lack of reflective, a lack of an education that teaches people to reflect on permanent things. In which yeah. I think we're very much in that now. I'm, I'm sorry to rant here, but uh, you know, I was at Harvard a, a month ago to talk to a Catholic student group, and I, one student was majoring in philosophy. Oh, that's good, you major in philosophy, you can take class in Aristotle. No, there is no class in Aristotle offered at Harvard University. So, and I don't know about Yale's philosophy department. And this is not p POMO lit crit uh, problem. It, there's a, a deep abandonment in our educa elite education. There's a, there's a profound abandonment of the metaphysical tradition of the West, which has many manifestations, like literary manifestations as well as technical philosophical manifestations. Sure. So I'll I'll briefly note that yeah, the issue I was thinking about was was Israel. This is like interesting interesting anecdote. I put on my Gail's like anonymous social media platform a poll, and the question was, October seventh was dot dot dot, and you had two options, multiple choice, um, <laughs> Israel's fault, Hamas's fault, and forty percent of students who took that poll, and it was like four hundred plus, uh, said that it was is that October seventh was Israel's fault. Which of course could mean some kind of, you know, like, oh, this is multiple steps away. It's like ultimately their fault and like the grand picture. But it's it's very interesting that we don't have that clarity. And I I would love to hear both of your thoughts on it as well. Well, I I, uh, I 
think Rusty's absolutely right in that it's shocking that 40% of the um, most coddled people in Western history should exhibit the, that kind of moral idiocy, in my opinion. But, um, I mean, they, people who go to Yale have every privilege that is available to people. It's, uh, it's, and the, the, if the idea, wh why do we have, why do we have universities? <laughs> uh, it, it used to be that we had them, we, and we give them all of these uh, incredible privileges. They're tax exempt. They're in, in a, well, not that New Haven is a particularly beautiful spot, but but it, they're 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 you know they tend to be um, you know ivory towers, and the, pr the professors are um, held up to uh, you know they're esteemed by the, their communities and so on. Uh, what we give them these privileges because we believed that they preserve and transmit the highest values of our civilization. That is clearly not the case anymore. I mean, um, maybe uh, important scientific research happens at a handful of big universities, including Yale. But the idea, I mean, re really they seem to be factories to um, uh, extract any sense of ingrained civilization that parents have carefully uh, instilled in their children for 18 years and then they come to a university uh, like Yale and have that uh, just comes sort of beaten out of them. Um, but uh, I, I'm, I won't say that I have a pessimistic view about the universities, but it's, um, I, would, I would call it realistic, but, it, but I, it's, it's definitely not, um, not upbeat. I'm not, I kind of wandered a little bit away from your question, but I, I, I would no like problem. to associate myself with everything that, that Rusty said. And uh, he mentioned Richard Rorty. I don't know how many people in the room have read Richard Rorty, but I, 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 I've written about him. I think I described him as a chummy nihilist. Uh, because he, he, he was very happy to say that, yes, he, you know, he didn't, really, didn't believe there was such a thing as truth. He thought of himself as a radical pragmatist where there's no difference between the question, uh, you know, uh, is this true or is it useful? He thought those were identical sorts of questions. And you go, you go down that road and uh, you, you wind up with the inability to distinguish between, as Rusty says, you know, the, de de the deliberate murder of a couple thousand people and um, the, the uh, you know, the, the unfortunate uh, killing of some civilians while you're undertaking a military operation. Yeah, I think it's somewhat of a cliche, but um, I'm reminded of this idea that we, we all worship something. And so you can either be thoughtful about what is worthy of your worship, or you can find that other things will fill in, you know, fill in the fill vacuum when you're not looking. And I think what we have is a society in which most people don't ever stop to think about the higher things in life. And so they end up, but again, it's, that's different from saying there's an absence of value or, or us of morality. It's, it's not quite, mm -hmm. I think that's not quite what's going on here. What, what we have is that people have invested their identity and their sense of morality and, and the, the sort of things that deserve to have our deepest um, commitments and, and, and to be so motivating to us are, are now being applied to the wrong things, to things that are, that are not important. So when you, when you don't have, some, have something higher than you that you're living, you know, serving in life, you end up serving, you end up just like whatever causes in front of you becomes the thing worth living and dying for. And, and then you end up with these insane sort of outcomes of, um, Causes that, and 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 young people who have who live privileged privileged lives and materially just like we are we are the most um, lucky fortunate people of you know of all time and anywhere in the world in terms of our, our material abundance and and all of that um, f needing to find other causes that they can so that they can be. Um, so that they can, so they have something to fight for because they don't, they haven't, they have to invent things to fight for because they, they don't, they haven't sort of um, pledged their life to something that is actually worthy of living for. I mean, it's not, it's telling that it's, it was referred to, it, we don't talk this way quite that much anymore, it was, it used to be called political correctness, not moral correctness. 
So it's a kind of misdirection of a fitting moral impulse that one ought to um, one ought to serve uh, and and um, and and, and uh, conform to high ideals, but they they get transmuted into into political programs that are very ideological in character. Yeah, it's interesting though the the uh, the highly moralistic aspect of political correctness, and I think that could be traced back to to Rousseau and his idea of virtue. He's always talking about virtue, but what he meant was his own emotion of virtue. It wasn't actually doing good. It, he was perfectly happy to to drop off each of his six children to the orphanage, which was <laughs> a, a prescription of death for them. But he's, you know, he he was in love with his, the sense of his own virtue. And that, of course, was taken up by Robespierre and the French Revolution, and he could write about virtue and its emanation, terror. And then, you know, uh, uh, Lenin picked up on that, and, uh, you know, uh, here we are. So people think, uh, you know, I'm more virtuous than you are because I care about the environment. Mm -hmm. Or I, I, I wear a mask. <laughs> I, I want to come back, Stephanie, to something that you, that you said about the comparisons he makes to the Soviet Union. This is sort of, we got that also in James Burnham's Suicide of the West, that the West is doomed because it's soft, and the communists may be wicked and evil, but at least they're hard, and the hard men will always triumph over the and soft the realists men. realists in a way that we're not. Yeah, and so, so I and I and I so I think and I I think it's it, it is useful to say that to to observe that, and you know certainly Germans um, in in the late 19th and early 20th century thought the Anglo-Saxon world was. Um, soft and commercial and cared only for profit and wouldn't fight actually um, it just turned out to be wrong um, and it could be that in our own reflections on the present state of American society young people are they're, they're obese they're you know uh, addicted to porn they they, uh, they, they you know they die of drug up you say oh the future is so bad but it could be that you know, in, amidst all the ruin, and there is always a great deal of ruin in a country, amidst all of our ruin, there are actually latent virtues that will manifest themselves when, when the country is under um, uh, greater stress. Um, so I think it's, it, it is helpful to sort of go, you know, he was maybe too pessimistic. Yeah. <laughs> both you and Stephanie and Roger both emphasize that. I think that's, that's, that's a fitting thing. And another thing on that point as well, it's very interesting for me, for Weaver, that he manifests a deep pessimism about modernity that was felt more, I think, it was, it was glossed over by the need to rebuild in Europe and by our feeling of having won the, the good war. But that underneath it was actually a lot of... Um, uh, a lot of destruction of ideals um, by the great cataclysm of 1914 through 1945. And he certainly uh, expresses that. Um, I think Albert Camus said in the late 40s, disaster is our fatherland. Um, so, and I think jo uh, John Kennedy was probably was almost certainly the most cynical president ever to occupy um, the Oval Office. Um, and I think that is rooted in his wartime experiences. Um, it just knocked a stuffing out of uh, Western culture that first half of the 20th century. And it's not an accident that we have a lot of anti-Western thinking in places like Yale, because it emerges out of that catastrophe. The only place you can find anti-Western thinking is in the West. Yeah. It is a pure product of the West. Um, uh, anti-colonialism, all these antis are Western, even though they, they, they it's a suicidal impulse, it's, a, a, it's an attack on the self, um, but it, it emerges, I think, out of this, um, this, this civilizational catastrophe, uh, and, I, and Weaver, Weaver was extremely sensitive to that. Um, I think after the war was over, there's a quote at the, uh, some, one of his letters about how he writes a friend saying, well, the buildings are still standing, but it's, it's not clear that there are any human beings to walk around in them. So I think we can go ahead for a couple uh, minutes of Q&A. 
from the audience. My friend, Mr. Barbie, has a microphone. Just to be specific about that. We've got one on the left-hand side. Oh, my left. Hello, thank you for speaking. Um, I had a philosophical question. Do you think it's possible to uh, reject the idea of metaphysical realism, right, in the, in the line of Plato, that there's, like, things like justice or beauty have independent, or meta metaphysical independent entities. Um, do you think that's the only way to combat nominalism, or is there some other way to believe in objective truth, for example, while also maybe not even believing in, like, metaphysical realism? Well, well, I think you, you have to be a metaphysical realist to be a metaphysical realist. <laughs> you have to be a metaphysical realist to be a metaphysical realist, it seems to me. So, in some way, if, if you see nominalism just broadly as uh, a rejection of the existence of metaphysical entities, um, then, then you, you're in some sense, the alternative is solely one of metaphysical realism versus nominalism. But I want to just defend Occam here. I mean, he believed in the existence of God, uh, which is certainly a metaphysical entity, uh, you know, uh, a supremely uh, one. And one reason he formulated nominalism was to accentuate uh, God's uh, omnipotence and uh, the, uh, the necessity of God's constant um, uh, God's constant thinkings of, of into existence of universals. And I think uh, um, Berkeley's idealism had the same kind of character, that these were theologically motivated in order to, um, it, it's, a, it's the same impulse against uh, um, idolatry and you know, getting rid of stained glass windows and things like that and, and statues that Calvinists did is that it, these are potentially distracting us from the one thing necessary, which is God. And I think that's what's really driving the Franciscan nominalist project. It wasn't, an, they were not trying to lay the foundations for, for, for modern nihilism. They were trying to accentuate theological truths that they felt could be undermined by um, uh, philosophical um, uh, focus on philosophy. Yeah, just to add to that, I mean, I think that the, uh, what the nominalists did was they, they rejected the, the, the Thomistic synthesis between Aristotle and Christianity, you know, notwithstanding the tensions that existed there, by, as Rusty says, emphasizing one of the divine attributes, will, um, you know, God, God was omnipotent. But then it leads to all these kind of questions, you know, could God, if God's omnipotent, could he create a stone so heavy that he couldn't lift it? You know, that, that's those sorts of uh, sort of silly puzzles. But I, what, what strikes me is that, the, is, is that it's, it's by this emphasis on one, one divine attribute, they sort of lose the, they, they lose the, um, the whole. It's, I mean, because there are other, other sides to, uh, to um, uh, divine reality. But I mean, I think your question, is you know could could we could we reject uh, Plato and the you know the idea of universals forms and that sort of thing and still hold on to reality something you know could could could, uh, uh, could we have Aristotle without Plato sort of sort of thing um, maybe but I think it's, uh, several people up here have, have noted that there, if you don't have uh, some notion of transcendence, something that's you know bigger than you, uh, that tends to be a prescription for nihilism, as Nietzsche put it. You know, uh, if, if you know, if, if if man is void of meaning, he'll take the void as meaning. Though there will be a uh, you know there'll be a, uh, uh, a nihilistic response to that. So um, I, uh, I I guess I would say that you know we, we we live in a world now where, as Eliot put it, we're distracted from distraction by distraction, you know TikTok and all of that stuff, and I think it, you know it's probably worth um, pausing, st stepping back, and uh, and you know listening to to uh, to um, those often inaudible voices that call us out of our present distraction to something more. And the, in those little pools of silence, uh, I think um, uh, that that's where you encounter uh, realities and you realize that 
Falstaff, amusing though he was, uh, was wrong about honor. That it's not just a word, it's not just air. There's something more. And if you start walking down that road, then pretty soon you're making other sorts of larger affirmations, I think. Do we have any more questions? For one, yeah. Hi, thank you all very much for speaking. I really appreciate it. Uh, just a quick question. If you had President Salve's ear and you were advocating for practical policy changes, what would you suggest? Practical policy changes at Yale? Yeah, oh. in terms of fixing the higher institution. I'd recommend he close it for a decade. <laughs> I, I'm, not, I'm not being funny. <laughs> Anyone else? I, I don't have, I'm, I'm not a Yaley, so. Policy and the, way, the many ways in which our higher education system has been distorted by bad public policy. So that's always a thing that I am hmm. focusing on um, in terms of, people will say sometimes like, you're a libertarian, so you, you don't have answers to any of our problems. And often I say, no, no, the answer is to get government to undo the, the bad things it's been doing all this time, that under, undergirding a lot of the problems. So I think higher education funding, um, I, am, I am very much not in the camp that says we ought to be punitively going after, you know, taxing um, endowments of universities if they don't, um, you know, articulate the the values that we think are important. I, I think that's a dangerous path to, path to go down, but I'm all for radically reforming um, the, the, federally, the federal student loan system, which I think has been a disaster. But I, in, in, you know, before we close it entirely, I think they should get rid of all of the pseudo programs. So they should get rid of you know, the, 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 the um, ridiculous things like women's studies and uh, all of that there that have no intellectual um, uh, substance at all. They're merely sops to mollify a, um, a political interest group. But this is a great example, I think, of something where um, if you trace it back, actually bad public policy undergirds. So both the fact that you have an unlimited amount of student aid, right, financial aid available for students who want to study anything they want to study. They don't have to d defend their, their choice of majors to a bank that is going to expect some sort of return on investment anymore because the federal government is subsidizing it all, and because there, is, there are federal government grant research grants that are propping up many of many, many colleges. And um, so I think if you just stop doing the bad things, this, this is my, like, the Hippocratic Oath uh, approach to things, like, just first <laughs> do no harm. Let's just stop breaking things. Then uh, then we can see what, what the actual market produces. Is, and then we can decide what are, the, what are the things that private institutions need to do to fix themselves. I guess I'll, that's a great, I'll be as radical as, as Roger, although at a different angle. I would advise the president to reinstitute mandatory weekly chapel. And uh, so you would have to, we live in a pluralistic society, so, you, but I think for most people, and this includes very smart, clever people. Most people um, encounter the transcendent through religious liturgies of various sorts. And this is, affects you even if you're an unbeliever. It just gives you some sense that there's more to life than just getting, getting, getting. And so, you know, we could have Jewish, you have to sign, you'd have to get your little whatever, your QR code validated on your phone that you attended. Um, the religious you service. You can even use those COVID them. things and just repurpose exactly. them. Exactly, yeah, you can sorry. repurpose them for something more fruitful. <laughs> well, that's, we're out of time, but thank you so much for speaking today.